When we started looking at special relativity, we began with the assumption that all observers that are moving inertially are equivalent. So if I have, you know, some, some spaceship, you know, out, out in deep space somewhere, so we can, you know, draw a couple stars, but far enough away that gravity isn't actually going to affect this guy. If this person is just moving inertially, they're going to be, you know, floating in their, in their little capsule, and they can say that they're at rest as long as they're moving inertially. If someone else flies by at a constant velocity, so they're still moving inertially, that person will be able to say that they're at rest. And there's no experiment that you can do that can determine which one is at rest. There's no special frame of reference. So when approaching gravity, what Einstein wanted to do was say, is there any way that we can generalize this, uh, this assumption of that's that worked very well in special relativity any way that a similar assumption can be made to gravity when we're, when we're dealing with gravity. So where do we see a situation where I feel like I'm floating, but just that also includes uh, gravitational effects? Well, let's say I have, you know, the Earth over here, uh, the surface of the Earth there, and I have a capsule above it, you know, the same kind of uh, capsule that I was using out in space, but this is going to be freely falling. And I'm a very dedicated physicist, so even though I'm about to crash into the Earth, I'm still doing experiments, so in that free-falling container, I will feel that I'm just floating there, and I will feel weightless, since I'm going to be falling at the same rate as my container. Back out in deep space, if I were to drop a ball, there's no gravity out there, so I just see the ball floating right next to me and not moving. In this frame of reference, if I release a ball, then the ball will be falling at the same rate that I am. So from my perspective, from my free-falling perspective, that ball is just going to float there in this case. And the question is, can we call these two observers, can we say that these are equivalent? So, so that's a question that we're dealing with. We can look at it another way. Let's say I take my capsule out in deep space and attach an engine to it. So here's my capsule, still out in deep space, but I attach some very strong motor, so I'm accelerating through space. Well, then I'd be able to stand on the ground of this, on the floor of this spaceship, and it would appear that there was gravity there. If I take a ball and release it, then the floor's pushing up on me, but nothing's pushing against the ball, so the ball will stay where it is, but I'm going to move upwards, and that will make the ball appear to fall and accelerate downward. Well, this looks like if I'm on the surface of the Earth, you know, I just have my capsule on the surface of the Earth and I'm, you know, standing there. I've got kind of short legs in this one, but, and I drop a ball and I will see that ball accelerate downwards. And one of the things that we, that we notice with this one, let's say I had, let's say I had another object, one that was heavier, then in this frame of reference, it makes a lot of sense that both of these objects are really at rest and it's me that's accelerating so both of these objects will appear to fall at exactly the same rate and that matches what we saw standing on the earth that objects with different masses all fall at the same rate so again we're asking are these two systems equivalent and this idea is referred to as the equivalence principle. Saying, if I'm free, if I'm floating out in space with no gravity, that's going to look just like free fall in a gravitational field. Or if I'm accelerating in a rocket, that's going to look exactly like I'm standing on the surface of the Earth.
Now, there are a couple of different versions of the equivalence principle. So let's, let's just kind of go through some of these different versions. There's the weak equivalence principle, which basically just says that all objects, regardless of composition, fall at the same rate in a, in a gravitational field. So this kind of corresponds with uh, what we talked about in the last video, that for some reason the inertial mass of an object seems to equal its gravitational mass. Uh, so weak equivalence principle just says all objects fall equally in all frames of reference. Next, there's the Einstein uh, Whoop, I spelled that wrong. Let me correct that. Uh, e I N. The Einstein equivalence principle, which says if I have any lab experiment, if I have any lab experiment and I take that experiment and set it into free fall, if I have that lab experiment and then apply free fall, then I will get the same result. Uh, I should say that this, for the Einstein equivalence principle, any non-gravitational experiment. So if I have, you know, a bunch of lasers set up to measure the emissions of some atoms, out, and this experiment's being done out in space, if I take that exact lab set up, bring it into this free-falling, uh, uh, free-falling frame of reference and do that experiment, I will get the exact same result. So that's the Einstein equivalence principle and then there's the strong equivalence principle which is just the Einstein equivalence principle but says the experiment can be gravitational. So any gravitational experiment done out in the middle of nowhere is going to be the same as, as, a, as a freely falling experiment. So if I have in my lab two heavy masses that I very carefully set in orbit around each other, uh, like a Cavendish experiment or something like that, um, which I might go into that particular experiment in a different video, then if I set up that same experiment in here, uh, I will get the same thing. Now, general relativity as Einstein wrote it, assumes all three of these uh, assumes all three of these conditions. There are modified versions of general relativity that don't assume or that don't satisfy the strong equivalence principle. Uh, but you can do experiments for each of these. Each of these assum assumptions has to be verified experimentally. Uh, in the last video, I talked about some of the experiments that are done that show that the inertial mass of an object and the gravitational mass match to extremely high accuracies. There are other experiments that say, well, if I have a non-gravitational experiment, say, you know, the decay of atoms or something, or, or experiments like that, then doing them in space should be the same as doing them in a freely falling uh, observatory. And there are different ways that you can study that and compare uh, different values that you get from experiments. And this has been, a number of experiments have been done to try to verify this. It's not nearly as easy to verify as the weak equivalence principle, but there are some experiments that I might talk about a little later. Uh, and then the strong equivalence principle is very difficult to measure. It's uh, one of the ways that you evaluate this is the gravitational constant g, uh, which equals 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11, and the units are meters cubed, kilograms minus 1 times second minus 2, and I just barely fit that in there. This value for Newton's gravitational constant, is that the same everywhere in the universe and at all times in the universe? And there's some evidence that it is. Uh, there have been some claims that it isn't exactly the same everywhere in the universe, but this is one way that you can test whether the strong uh, version of the equivalence principle applies. In the next video, we'll look at some of the, some of the results that occur if 
the Einstein equivalence principle or if the strong uh, equivalence principle are actually uh, are true. So we'll look at that in the next video.